Um, Edge was married at the time to a woman named Lisa. Uh, did you know Lisa? Had you met her before? Was that uh, the first, second, or third one? Okay. So. Well, no, I'm, I'm, and I don't mean that to be mean. I, I really and truly don't. Uh, was that his first wife? I, I don't know. I, all of his I, I knew his first wife. I was there when he asked her to marry him. That was Val Venus's sister. I don't remember, man. I think it was his second wife, though. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, for the purposes of our story, I don't know that it matters. I don't know that Well, it's... you asked the question. Well, I asked if you knew her, and you, you kind of buried him and asked which one. So that wasn't... No, it's not a burial. He knows. I love him to death. Uh, he married Elena Morley in 2001. Uh, they divorced in 2004. Uh, Lisa Ortiz was his second wife. They married in October of 2004 and would divorce November the following year. I wonder why. Uh, he's with number three now, and I think you're kind of being Beth. a jerk with that, and that's Beth I'm Phoenix. not being a jerk with that. I well, just, he said first. He's had two third, successful but... divorces. Yeah, okay. All right. Anyway, didn't want, didn't mean to get sidebarred. He's married at the time to Lisa Ortiz. They're married in October of 2004. Uh, Matt and Lita had been together at this point when all this is going down in 2005 for like six years. They started dating in early 1999, uh, where this is starting to feel very TMZ like, but this is what we're talking about. Uh, Matt is off the road here in 2005 with a reconstructive knee surgery. He torn his ACL and was set to be out for like nine months. So right in the middle of uh, his career here he's sidetracked not too long after the split uh lisa i'm sorry lita had uh started traveling alone uh in the absence of matt of course they were traveling together uh and prior to this uh, he had been on smackdown and doing really well after a draft and, and a split they separated them and i want your kind of feedback as to why if you know that matt hardy and Lita are together, and we saw this this year with Del Rio and Paige. Why does the company split couples like this, where Matt is now on SmackDown and Lita is on Raw? Well, it's it's not it had nothing to do with you know their personal situation. Um, it's just one of those things where it's time for a change and split it up on screen and do a little bit something different. But, you know, that that's one of those things that just kind of happens. Well, you know, some, some people they'll keep together, some people they won't. Why don't you think there would be consideration given to that? There is some consideration. I don't know that there was necessarily consideration given to that, though. Okay. Uh, so that's a non-answer. Let's move along. Uh, no, I, I did answer. You didn't like my answer. Well, it just seems, it seems random that, you know, well, sometimes they are and sometimes they're not, but why? Because sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. But you can't give because, me any reason as to why. Because you here. want to do something different with them and having them on the same thing, they're going to gravitate towards the same old, same old. When you get them separated, they get in new territory and maybe they'll exceed and they'll do something different. So you're, you're, what you're saying is you're trying to get the individual performer outside of a comfort zone behind Correct. the scenes, not necessarily creatively in front of the camera. All the above. Okay. See, I, I don't think that was that hard. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> Lita is uh, traveling alone here because Matt's home. Uh, and, and Lita, uh, this is worth mentioning, even though they're separated, Matt asked to come to Raw. So when he comes to Raw, he's not featured nearly as prominently. Uh, they were doing something with him on SmackDown, not so much on Raw. Do you have any comments about that? No. I mean, it was it was simply a situation of, you know, like you said, there was something for him there on SmackDown with the brand split, and they, you know, had people for him to work and things for him to do there. And on Raw, there, there wasn't that fit there. So here's my question. It was, it was a different environment. Who, who, were, who were the writers on each show? Was it the same writing group? No. Or was it split? Okay. So no, it was split writing group. Talk us through who would have been on the writing staffs of SmackDown and Raw at the time? Uh, Brian and Ed on Raw. would have been probably on Raw. And 
Brian Michael Gerwitz and, and DJ would have been on SmackDown. Michael Hayes and, and DJ is who? Christopher Joseph. Okay. Well, I'm just saying you're speaking in shorthand. Not everybody listening knows who these people Well, are. I'm trying to remember. I And you're on meds. Keep up. You're it. telling people to stick stuff in their Google machine. All right. Krista Joseph and Michael Hayes on SmackDown are taking good care of Matt Hardy. Ed Kosky and Brian Gerwitz don't have anything for him. Gerwitz. Okay. Well, thank you. So you said Not Brian. Gerwitz. You said Brian, and if you would pronounce it. You know what? You know what? This is a small world. Brian Gerwitz just bought one of my shirts from ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Bruce Pritchard. He bought I Wrote This Shit. Did he really? Yes, he really and truly did. I sent you a screen grab of it so that you can see it. And uh, Yes, he did. Thank you, Brian. Brian, I'm... I'm I sent you a personal text. Uh, Livio Marino in Independence, Missouri, just bought uh, the I Love You shirt and the box of gimmicks as we've been on here recording this. So I'll thank Livio on air here for uh, their purchase. I'm going to call them when we hang up. But, yeah, Brian Gortz <laughs> just bought while we're, shooting the, while we're shooting this. Actually, we're recording that. Uh, you and I are shooting it. Um, just bought the I Wrote This Shit shirt. So it's worth mentioning, uh, if you go to pro wrestling tees forward slash Bruce Pritchard and you pick up a shirt, as long as Bruce is not dying, uh, he will call and thank you. That's a new thing that you've started doing. And, uh, it's pretty cool that you're doing that, Bruce. Well, I even made calls today <laughs> with my pneumonia. So, well, either way, we'd love to see you in one of these shirts. You're going to love the shirt and we want to be as fan friendly as we can. So how can you be, you get a great shirt and you get a phone call from brother love himself, hook it up. ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Bruce Pritchard. Uh, you're going to love the way you look. It's an old men's warehouse line, but uh, I love my love shirt, and you will too. So help me understand. You said a minute ago they had something for him and people to work with on SmackDown, and they didn't on Raw. If they know that well, they, going in, why do they let why do they let him move? Like, why don't they say, no, you can't move? Probably because he wanted, he wanted to move. He was unhappy where he was. Didn't want unhappy people around. Well, he didn't want to be split up to begin with, but you did it. So, so help me understand. So you get split up. You have an opportunity to do something. You're unhappy with that. You want to go back somewhere else. And, and so here's my question. That's a chance you take. I get that. But is there a little bit of you? And I want you to just be honest here and not just go right into defense mode. Is there a little bit of. God damn, we're pushing the kid and he's still not happy. He wants to be over here. We're going to fucking put him on the bottom for a little while. No, it's simply a situation of when you're sitting there and you're writing TV and from a frustration standpoint on the SmackDown side, I'm going to venture a guess. I'm not going to say this is what it was, but I'll venture a guess where it's like, damn, we've got something for him over here. We want to do something with him. He doesn't want that. He wants to go over there. Well, now Raw's sitting there going, well, we've already got, you know, stuff going on with other people. Now we've got a new guy and it's a different environment, different situation. It feels a little bit to me like if I had to put myself in those shoes, which admittedly, obviously I never have, I would feel some pressure to find something for everyone, but I might feel a little less pressure if this guy was already getting a push somewhere else and then came over and he was just kind of thrown in my lap, I might say, well, listen, if something awesome pops up, I'll give it to him, but I'm not going to go out of my way to try to make this work. I've got all these other guys I'm trying to cater to. Try not to do that though. I mean, you, you try to do something as best you can for everybody, but unfortunately the, the reality of the situation is probably what you said. Um, I can't speak for them. Right. Okay. Well, good deal. Let's move along a little bit and, uh, let's talk about it. Uh, so let's set the stage again. Ed is married to a woman named Lisa. They've been married since October of 04. We're now in, uh, February of 2005. So not that long, uh, into that marriage, uh, edge, um, or I'm sorry, Matt and Lita have been together though, about six years at this point. And Matt's home. He's off the road. He's got a torn ACL. He's rehabbing to come back. He's supposed to be sidelined for like nine months. Everybody knows a torn ACL is pretty legit. So Lita's traveling alone. Edge is traveling alone. Obviously, these guys were all big friends. Uh, he asks um, if they can travel together. She runs it past Matt. Matt says, hey, cool with me. You know, you guys are buds. 
they go from casual friends to being alone in these long car rides every night, which the company still has them doing. Uh, it's routine for them to you know drive 250, 300 miles a night after the show. So that lends itself to two people just talking. And when men and women do that over and over and over on this crazy schedule, things happen. And things certainly started to happen. Matt would say that Lita started to act weird around Valentine's Day in 2005. And then a week or so later, he goes through her voicemail in the middle of the night, which is never a good move for those of you listening. If you're a young person, don't do that. Uh, No good can come from that. And it didn't hear. Uh, He listened to the voicemail and he heard Edge professing his love for her. Uh, He immediately forwards those to himself and Hurricane Helms before confronting her with the voicemails on his own phone and then promptly throws her out, leaves a nasty message for Edge and then takes her pictures off his website, puts, t- puts away all her pictures in the house, uh, and a few days later wondered if it could be fixed. But, of course, we all know that didn't work out. Uh, well, then it gets out on the Internet, supposedly, when Matt Hardy's friend writes a blog. And then it goes viral, as they say, and Matt starts airing the dirty laundry everywhere. And I would imagine this happens from a trying-to-save-face standpoint, and maybe just trying to put the heat on them. But he's obviously in a very an, emo- an emotional state when all this happens. When's the first time you remember hearing, Houston, we have a problem? Well, I was in Houston at the time. And <laughs> I actually wasn't, wasn't there when it all first started happening. I had some personal issues going on at home. And, you know, I was not going to TVs on a regular basis. I, I was, you know, kind of maybe once a month at the time. People online are going to hear what you just said and assume that you're saying uh, you had drug issues. That's not the case. No, not the case. Okay. You, had, you, you had a family situation. Yeah, family issues. Okay. And so uh, my my involvement was over the phone. Uh You know, I'm hearing pretty much rumor and innuendo like everyone else at the time. So I wasn't there in the pit for probably the very beginning of it. I didn't come back full time until right after uh, Matt was let go. Okay. Uh, So that was, it was, it was, I don't know, it was like six, eight weeks maybe in that time frame. So let's go through it. Uh, on April 11th, 2005, Matt is released. Uh, he says that Johnny Ace called him while he was rehabbing for his comeback and told him he was going to be released because, quote, creative doesn't have anything for you. Uh, Matt says he pressed and wanted to know if this had anything to do with his personal situation. And Johnny Ace said no. Uh, Matt believes that Ace had a personal vendetta against him. Uh, and Johnny Ace would later say that he had multiple conversations around this time about being immature and making emotional decisions and that he did not have a personal vendetta. He had just simply spoken to him several times, uh, about this, uh, at the shows fans start chanting, you screwed Matt at edge, which really starts to get him over as a heel in a big way, whether they wanted it or not. Uh, they're ch- alternating, I guess, between you screwed Matt and we want Matt. I think everybody remembers at one night stand that year, uh, Paul Heyman says something along the lines of hide your wives. It's, uh, hide your wives. It's edge. And then later says he has two words for him, but says three Matt freaking Hardy and, um, edge does the fake spit take and just got a big pop catering to the fans, uh, for the cheap pop. Uh, Edge and Lita at this time would go on record uh, in every interview since and say that they really felt like they had been alienated in the locker room and that the locker room had turned on them. Do you remember any sort of situation like that when you came back after he was gone? You know, let's go back to the whole Johnny Ace thing. Okay. Um, I believe, I do believe Johnny's take on that. And I'm sure that there was probably a feeling that, Matt airing his dirty laundry and and Matt being emotional and going public with everything probably didn't help his cause. 
and I'm sure that Johnny probably tr- had several conversations with him. I was not privy to the conversations between Matt and Johnny, but that wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Um, and as far as Adam and Lita kind of being ostracized a little bit, yeah, there were, I think guys that looked at it, you know, the bro code and felt that not cool. You know, Matt's at home, but at the same time, look, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to take sides here. Life happens sometimes. And as you say, you know, they're in the road, they're on the road, they're in the car for many hours, every single night in between towns, shit happens. I'm saying right. Not saying it's wrong. It's just life. Life happens sometimes. And I dare say in the end, as we all sit here today, everything worked out, you know, pretty good on all sides, you know, on all fronts, but it, it sucked at the time going through it on both sides of it. And so you fast forward a little bit, you know, Heyman does his stuff and, uh, the Matt freaking Hardy comment and the audience, you know, the audience is intelligent, man. They know, you know, they read the crap and so they're, they're doing the chance. And it's one of those situations that I always would say to people, you know, talent can't be denied. Right. And if it's there, you know, it's there. So there was a groundswell of, man, we want Matt Hardy. The real life story that was going on behind the scenes was now taking place in front of the cameras. And we've only got, you know, two thirds of this trilogy here. So you're sitting there going, okay, do you just ignore it? You know, when the crowd hijacks a, a live show with we want Matt chance and bringing signs and everything else, do you just go, okay, well, uh, they'll go away. After a while, they don't go away. They get louder. So I'd come back at that time, and as, as I've stated before, you know, kind of like with the, the, the Kurt Angle, Jeff Jarrett situation, whenever there is – reality thrown into a storyline, a make-believe storyline, and people question whether that's real or not. Right. Those are the best. Absolutely. <clears throat> when you can't tell if it's real or Memorex, those are the best. And, you know, I threw out the idea, what if? What if Matt Hardy came back? Can they work together? Because what people forget is that these characters that are larger than life on TV and are in your living rooms every week, they're just real life people going through the same shit that you're going through. They just happen to work on TV. Right. And happen to be known by millions of people by their stage names but they still have emotions and feelings and real life problems just like everybody else. So you have to weigh that when you look at mixing, uh, real life, you know, art imitates life, life imitates art. And when you play with that fire, sometimes you get burned, but it's, it's a touchy, touchy subject. So uh, I'd kind of come off, come back from not being there every week. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, do, 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 do. Um, what if, guys? You know, they've been living it. The, the guys there, they've been living it every week. And, you know, I come in, I'm all fresh. I'm all happy to be back. You know, shit, I've, I'm rested. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be, uh, back at work. So I get in and I throw the idea out there. Well, I'm sure that the idea had been thrown out there many times before, but all of a sudden it's a new, you know, new, new voice. You know, so God damn it. Why the hell didn't anybody else think of this type deal? And, 
you know, it's, it's, uh, we tried it on, you know, and, and it's like, well, talk to them and see if they're game for it. So I took, uh, before you get to that go ahead. Uh, on camera, they had already started to put them together. So edge and Lita, Lita and, and edge. edge. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. They're, they're on camera together and it's a natural decision because, you know, they're taking over whenever Lita comes out to do a promo, they're taking over with these chants and they can't do anything but address them. Um, kind of the similar situation with edge, no matter what they're, pl- they're supposed to do based on the script or storyline, uh, this thing has taken over a life of its own. So they put them together, make them heels and edge sort of starts to become the rated R superstar that he would eventually really level up with. And Lita started saying she was finally with a quote unquote real man. And so they're talking about it, but not really talking about it. And they're making out and talking about sex and lots of crazy stuff. Um, and around the same time, Matt Hardy is really going off the deep end with crazy stuff online. And it looks like he's almost unhinged. He's calling himself the angelic Diablo and doing crazy videos in a hot tub and such. Uh, the beginning of this broken character that has really gotten over, you can kind of see some of the seeds of this here. Uh, before you pitched this, had they already done the wedding angle? I don't remember. I, I don't remember the timing of it. So, but real, so real quick, I do. in June, they do a wedding angle with Edge and Lita, and they ask if it, you know, they hold speak now forever, hold your peace, and they play Hardy's music. Of course, Hardy's not there, but it's just built feeding into this more and more and more. I mean, almost like a wrestling's version of a Rickroll right there. Um, and then of course we see that they have made on, on July 11th, 2005, Matt returns unannounced backstage and attacks edge before being run off by the agents. There's something at the end of the match. We'll talk about our end of the night too. We'll talk about in a minute, but get back to how you finally kind of get everybody to at least consider this as an angle and you pitch it. Vince doesn't hate it. He likes the idea. Where do we go from here? Well, you know, feelers were sent out. I think Michael talked to Matt and it was, uh, my duty to sell it to Matt and Lita. And that was not an easy sell. And I remember taking them up into the stands in an arena, wherever the hell we were for TV and pitching the idea, they were dead set against it. They had lived it. And it was a very difficult, it, it had been a difficult time for everybody involved. And, you know, it was obviously a difficult time for Matt. It was obviously a difficult time for Lita. And it was obviously a difficult time for Adam. And not saying anybody's right or wrong, it just sucked. My feeling was, well, hell, might as well make some money with it. The audience is begging for it. It's real. The emotions are there, so you don't have to worry about getting into character. Um, Can you do it? Can you work with them? Would you be willing to try this on with the proviso that if it doesn't work and it gets out of hand, we would end it? And... They thought about it, they being Edge and Lita, and reluctantly agreed to do it. So um, I really don't remember who the hell talked to Matt. I think think it was Michael, and then obviously probably Johnny Ace was involved. But we came up with the idea to, to have Matt jump the railing and come in and attack Edge. But the the most fucked up thing that happened that night was that I had to get edge and Matt Hardy together for the first time since all this shit blew up and go over what we wanted to do, you know, physicality wise and and what we were going to do because not everyone knew that Matt Hardy was going to be there and that what we were going to do with Matt, it wasn't widely known. We had snuck Matt in And we had him at a separate hotel and we had sent a car over to go pick him up a stretch limousine. And when I knew the limousine was there, Edge and I went out 
And I sat between them in a car and explained what we were going to do. And it was the first time they had seen each other. They shook hands. They were very professional and uh, laid everything out for them. And so we see it on July 11th, 2005. Uh, as I said before, Matt returns unannounced and attacks Edge backstage. Uh, they shoot it like it's a shoot. The agents run him off. Uh, they don't get a clear camera angle. It just feels rushed. Um, so it makes it feel authentic. And then towards the end of the show, he jumps uh, from the, the crowd into the ring, and security tries to separate them as he attacks Edge. Uh, and eventually Hardy gets on the mic, and this is where you guys really started to make it feel real. He refers to Edge as Adam, which is the first time that had happened in this situation. And he even referred to Lita as a whore, which shocked me, even for WWE standards. Uh, but then he even yells Ring of Honor and ROH before saying that WWE can kiss his ass kind of carry me through whose idea it was to and i know we just talked a minute ago about when you can blur the lines between reality that's when it really makes it awesome so you can kind of point things on the show and say okay i know i know that's kind of you know winking or nod tongue and cheek but this this was real whose idea is it obviously vince green lighted all the ideas but whose idea is it to use his real name to do the whore thing, and most of all, this is what shocks me the most, to say Ring of Honor on air. It's a collaboration. I mean, it, it was all of us getting together, and what you know, what can we do to give this a, a real feel to it? Um, you know, the, the realest thing that happened that night, on top of everything, was it was the first time that Amy had seen Matt in a long time. I didn't get Amy together with Matt. So she was the, not ready. She was not ready for that at that point. So when Matt comes out and then later on backstage, I mean, Amy was, was emotional and, um, I felt horrible about that. You know, I, I, I second guessed that one and, and felt really bad about that because it, you know, again, I, I keep saying the, these poor guys were, were in really awkward positions and we're asking them to do this for business sake and, um, and it's real life emotions, man. You know, she was with Matt for a long time and it just was very emotional and, and, and it was real to, to a large extent, you know, both guys giving their body to the other and, and not knowing, you know, somebody's going to take a cheap shot or, or what's going to happen. And, you know, I, I say to this day, Everybody was extremely professional. Uh, so you get Matt and Edge before the show. Is this the day of the show when you get them together for the first time, or do they meet before this actual? No, that time? was that night. It was probably the the show, the live event had started. So the show's already happening, and you just get them in a limo to talk. Yes, Matt arrived in the limo, and I brought Edge out to him. And at that point, you specifically wanted to keep her out of there, or did she request to stay out of there? She, I, I didn't need her at that point, and I, I knew that she was emotional. I knew that she didn't, you know, she wasn't ready for that. Okay. I didn't need her, and I didn't, I, so rather than muddy the water and put the object above, you know, everyone's desire in the middle of it, there, it wasn't necessary. You know, there, there was an issue between two guys that used to be friends um, and were ready to, you know, can we put the past behind us and move forward? So I, I've uh, had the privilege of being, you know, kind of behind the scenes at these shows with Rick a few times. And uh, it's interesting to see. You know, just the social behaviors, you can kind of tell that there's groups of people who are super tight and then groups of people who aren't necessarily, it's not necessarily that anyone's cross, but, um, it's just different, you know, just like in real life or any work environment, anywhere in the world. Do you remember, you know, where, where edge and Lita kind of 
shunned or is there a certain group of people who just didn't care and hey that's y'all's business or did people have a lot of sympathy for matt and did that change when matt comes back that night and he's around all these people for the first time did some of these guys have to feel like they needed to babyface matt even if they really hadn't been prior? well matt wasn't around the guys in the back matt was thrown out Matt was taken out. Matt went in a different way. Matt was taken out afterwards. He wasn't around the guys. But, you know, I already said before, you know, Matt and Lita had, had kind of been shunned a little bit and you know, from from everything that had taken place. But once Matt came back, you know, it, it kind of all was just one big happy family again. And So what's the answer? It wasn't a happy family. It was that family that says, okay, we've got to work together and let's do what we need to do and be professional. Everybody's talking about this. Um, so, you know, when one of the boys comes up that night and sees that Matt's there and says, Bruce, what's up? Uh, Matt's here. What's going on? Well, Matt wasn't there. Well, they see him. When they he told you he came in a limo. He sat out in the back. When it was time for him to come in, we snuck him in. He hits the ring. He's thrown out. We sneak him back in. He does his thing backstage and is thrown out again. So he wasn't hanging around in the back. He wasn't. Talking with guys. But I, I guess what I'm asking is, the intent was to work the boys? No, the intent wasn't to work anybody. It was the intent was for people not to be talking about it, for not to get out, and to give the air of reality because we were shooting backstage. And to give that air of this isn't supposed to happen. And if he's back there and they're all hanging out and bullshit and everybody sees it and, and there's not that same intensity. There's not that same feeling. So there, we didn't want him back there. We didn't want some, some security guard with a camera snapping a picture and posting it online or anything like that. So the idea was to give it a real feel. I, I, I follow all of that. You know, I, I got that. I guess what I'm, maybe I'm not asking the right way. After SummerSlam this year, when Brock Hardway, Randy Orton, Rumors and innuendo would lead you to believe that Chris Jericho goes to Michael Hayes and says, what the fuck? And then there's maybe or maybe not an incident, depending on, you know, which version of that story you believe. I guess my question is, does anyone come to the, to, to you guys and say, Hey dude, what the fuck? After he's been out there, not, not that I remember. I mean, I'm busy, you know, doing, doing a live show and doing stuff. I'm busy. I, I don't have time to. I, I, you know, I don't have time to wonder about what everybody else is doing and worrying about, and I don't have time to sit there and, and answer questions about everything else. And, I mean, that that sounds assholeish. Like, yeah. Huh? Sounds assholeish. Well, no, I'm sorry. I have a job to do. I've got a live television show that I'm trying to After run. After the show's over, nobody says, "Dude, what's up?" Not Martin? that I remember. No. So uh, I guess I'm sure is- they were talking amongst themselves, but I. I, I when you're producing a television show while well, having you responsible for all that stuff, I don't have time for that. Yeah. We learned last week. You don't even have time to keep them from wandering out when they're fucked up. Uh, help me understand. You, you've told me in the past when I asked about working the boys and that you felt horrible about it. Now you're kind of working the boys and you're defending it. Hardcore. No work. I'm not working the boys. We just didn't, didn't tell them, you know, that there's a big difference. There's, you're sitting there and you go, okay, hey, this is going to happen. Why do tell me this? Why do they need to know everything that's going to happen? Well, I'm not saying they do. Well, you are because if we, if they don't know every single thing that's happened, we're working them. So if we want to surprise everybody, we should get everybody together and say, okay, this is what we're going to do tonight, folks. We should have the run sheet. We should post the run sheet I, I, online I so everybody can see that. I don't, and. And when we have our surprise, they should just see that. And there should be no shock or surprise or actual genuine emotion. You done? I guess one. Okay. Let me fucking know when it's my turn to talk and I'll talk. Okay, your turn. 